let us turn to God's word <clears throat> and to that passage that we read in Psalm 32. And I have a confession up to yesterday. I had no idea what I was going to speak on this morning. One of those weeks where, uh, for various reasons, um, but it became clear this morning what the reason uh, was, and I wasn't even conscious of uh, the connection between last week and this week uh, until about halfway through the preparation, because last week we spoke on the uh, doctrine of repentance, and this morning from this psalm I want to speak on what I'm calling the freedom of forgiveness which is really the the natural and biblical follow-on from the doctrine of repentance and i don't think i've ever preached on this psalm before i've certainly referred to it many times and it is a central passage of scripture dealing with the issue of forgiveness and indeed justification but particularly the forgiveness of our sins. It is a psalm of David. It is a masculine, which is an instructive or a didactic poem, a, a teaching poem or song. And we shall sing some of the verses after we have preached uh, from it. I won't give you the headings. We have seven uh, points we want to consider from this psalm. I'll give them to you as we go through the psalm this morning. The first thing we want to see from the psalm is in verses 1 to 2 we have what I'm calling a recommended state or a recommended condition. Advertisements often say you need this. This will transform your life. You will wonder how you ever managed without this thing. Quite often this time of year or at birthdays we receive things to lesser or greater degree. We realize we could have well managed uh, without them. But advertisements put a big uh, emphasis on this principle, this trick if you like, that you your life will just not be the same and you will realize how badly you needed this now that's just a sales pitch isn't it but this text recommends to us advertises to us in verses 1 to 2 what we and every soul needs this morning we need the forgiveness of God this is the number one need of our soul. It says in the text that the forgiven one is blessed. The, the word simply means happy. Like Psalm 1, it's the same idea. Happy is the man. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Blessed is the child whose transgression is present tense forgiven. For those of us who are raised um, Roman Catholics, we were often told that we can never be finally sure, but that's not what this psalm says. It's the present tense forgiveness of all sin. It's like the presidential pardon, and <clears throat> the American system has that sort of thing where the, the president can just give a pardon by his own will and just <coughs> sign a piece of paper. And somebody that might have 10, 15, <clears throat> 20 years or life in prison can be pardoned, set free in a moment of time. Imagine how that prisoner would feel, especially maybe one on death row, which is probably the best illustration of the principle. And without any knowledge, pre-knowledge, he gets this announcement, you're pardoned. The door's open, go, you're free. Imagine 
the feeling when he realizes that nobody can challenge what the president has declared. Well, that's an illustration of a far greater forgiveness, a far greater pardon that we have received. But then also notice it says, not only whose transgression is forgiven, but whose sin is covered. We think of the mercy seat, the covering of the mercy seat. We think of God covering our sins with the blood of Christ. Not just hiding, but covering them, atoning for those sins. We actually use this word, don't we, in colloquial usage. We might say, you know, off the cuff, I've got that covered. You know, sometimes we might go to a restaurant with somebody and say, you know, that's covered, it's paid for. That's actually the meaning, isn't it? God has taken care. He has paid for our sins. He's literally got it covered. We don't have to worry anymore about our sins. We are in truly a blessed state. We are in a happy condition as we come to the Lord's table this morning. We are happy men, women, and children if we know the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ. Psalm 85 verse 2 puts it this way, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people, thou hast covered all their sin. It goes on to say in verse 2 of our present text, Another blessed, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity. In other words, he doesn't reckon against us what should be reckoned. We should have our crimes, our sins, our iniquities listed. But we are happy in Christ because they are not. We are blessed because he has cast our sins behind his back. He has cast them into the deepest sea. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And as someone has said, I'm not sure who the first person who said this was, uh, but it's a precious thought. The scripture does not say north from south, because if you keep going south, you'll eventually go back to north again. But east and west never meet. You never come back to west, you just keep going east. Imagine going to one you owed a lot of money to and you, you don't have the ability to pay it. You don't have the, the wherewithal. You're, not only is your bank balance zero, it's actually in the red. And you meet somebody who you owe money to. And they take the ledger and they tear out the page, rip it up and say it's gone. No debt. Of course, if we were talking about justification, we would go further than that. We would say not only does God just cancel the debt, he actually gives us everything, which is uh, the meaning of justification. We have positive righteousness. But then we see also in these first two verses the fruit of all this, the consequence of all this, in whose spirit there is no guile. You see, forgiveness leads to holiness. Because when you know that you're forgiven, when you know that God has got this covered and has paid for your sins, when he's <clears throat> just put a line through the ledger and say, the debt's gone, what effect does that have on your life? You want to live for him. See, that's why we, we must make a distinction between forgiveness and sanctification. They're not the same thing, but one is the root of the other. You see, rather than, as some people say, to us, rather than uh, free forgiveness causing laziness, free forgiveness and, yes, justification causes us to want to live for the glory of God. Because we are his children. We are his family. We were talking about this during the week, weren't we? With the doctrine of election and predestination on Wednesday morning in our, in our confession class. Rather than election and predestination being a cause of just 
indifference. It actually motivates us because God has chosen us to be holy and without blame before him in love. But then secondly, not only do we see a recommended state in verses 1 and 2, we see a woeful state in verses 3 to 4. A woeful state. A terrible state. The cause of the woe is verse 3. When I kept silence. Somebody, I remember a number of years ago, somebody on a program about crime made the point that uh, criminals, especially serial criminals and serious serial criminals, often are relieved when they're caught. Because they're caught up in their crime, they're caught up in what they're doing, and there's actually a measure of relief that at last they can, at least on a human level, be honest about what they are. There's a measure of unburdening now, that's not salvation, just on a human level, but again, it is uh, analogous to salvation because in these verses when we don't confess when we don't acknowledge sin it becomes a tremendous burden when we live in sin it becomes a tremendous burden to the soul so it's these words when I kept silence also it's been said that confession is good for the soul it's not a biblical quote but it's a biblical idea I remember as a young believer, a preacher saying we keep short accounts with God, and I actually didn't know what he meant. It took me a few years to figure out what it actually meant. But we are to keep short accounts with God. We're not to allow the bank balance of our sin to build up in days and weeks and months and possibly even years, because that will have a devastating effect on our soul. You see, 1 John 1 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We are to confess. But we see also in these two verses, verses 3 and 4, the threefold experience of woe. It is inward. My bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. This is the power, the devastating crushing power of the conscience it's the devastating crushing power of the conscience that will literally make our bones feel as if they are being crushed waxing old falling apart so in Romans 2 verse 15 Paul speaks of the Gentiles who don't even have the law but have the conscience of the law of God written on their hearts so they know right and wrong. They know when they're doing wrong and they're in the, the terrible state. Those who have not heard the gospel of knowing the problem but not having the solution. Someone said to us on Thursday past in the open air in the city, you know, or was it last week? Anyway, in the last week or so, somebody said to us, well, what about the people down in the Amazon that have never heard the gospel? And I don't know if those people exist, maybe some of our Brazilian uh, brethren can tell us. Is there places still that have not heard the gospel in, in that part of the world? But that's not a reason to make a second gospel. It's a reason to go with the gospel. Because the gospel is the only answer. There is no secondary way of salvation. And therefore that's why in history... Uh, the vast majority of the, at least the well-known evangelists held to that the gospel was the only answer because of their Calvinistic theology. There is no hope in the will of man because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the only hope. Therefore I said to the man without blinking an eye, I said to him, if there is people in the Amazon rainforest that have never heard the gospel, they have no hope. If they've not heard the gospel. They have no hope. We must go with the gospel. It is the only way of salvation. There is no secondary way that God will somehow look into their hearts. Because all he'll see there is desperate wickedness. There's no hope in the heart of man of salvation. 
But then secondly, not only is it inward, it is Godward. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. If it wasn't bad enough that your own, that your own conscience is tearing you apart and bearing you down, the unconfessed sin of the sinner leads God to be against you and practice even for the believer. Even for the believer, he will bring us down in order to bring us up, but yet he will bring us down. There's a pressing down, making the psalmist weak, unable to stand up, being pressed inwardly and outwardly. But then thirdly, illustratively, in the words, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Nothing to refresh. This almost sounds like the, the rich man in Luke 16, crying out for even a drop of water. We sang in Psalm 63, Lord, thee, my God, I'll early seek my soul, the thirst for thee. Crying for refreshment, but no relief comes. Why? Because it all goes back to the very first words, I kept silent. See, one of the problems, brothers and sisters, isn't it, that we, we try and figure things out ourselves, don't we? You know, we're in a problem, we're in a sin, we're backsliding, and we try and figure it out ourselves. It's almost like we're trying to get ourselves a bit better and a bit of, bit of a better position before we go back to God. That's just human religion. And it's vain human religion. Just come to the Lord Jesus. Come like the woman in the gospel with her stench of dried blood upon her clothes as she reaches out and takes hold of the hem of Christ's garment. Just come to him. Don't prepare. Just come. Just come. Come to Christ. Even now, if you've not prepared for the Lord's table, if you've not prepared for worship, come now and confess that sin, confess that wickedness, confess that pride, confess that lust, that covetousness, that hatred, that anger, whatever it is, just confess it, acknowledge it before God. And there's immediate forgiveness. Why? Not because how well you said it, but because God has got it covered. God has paid the price. The blood of God has paid for your sin. And then, thirdly, we have the liberated soul. The liberated soul in verse 5. We have the act or the action of confession, which is such a contrast from verse 1. In verse 5 it is, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. It is the acceptance of personal guilt. Mine iniquity have I not hid, not like Adam and Eve in the garden, not like them hiding amidst the trees and covering themselves with their own coverings. No, I acknowledge, I confess, it's my sin. It's not just that we're all sinners. I have sinned. I have done this evil in thy sight. But there's also the engagement of the will. Look what it says. I said, I will confess my transgressions. We must decide. We must actively and willingly Come before God in confession of our sin. Who do we confess to? This might sound like an obvious question. But for those of us, again, who are raised in the Roman Catholic uh, tradition, it seems you can confess to all sorts of people. But biblically, there's only one. It says, it is unto the Lord. David could say, against thee, thee only, Psalm 51, verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Now remember, he committed adultery and murder. 
So he'd sinned against quite a few people. He'd sinned against the nation. He'd sinned against Uriah and murder. He'd sinned against Bathsheba. He'd sinned against the principle of authority, taking advantage of his position as king. So his sins were manifold, but yet he could say in Psalm 51, when it comes to the principle of, the central principle of confession, confessing sin, it is uniquely against God. It is uniquely against God. Which, which teaches us the principle that we need to get right with him, and when we're right with God, we're right full stop. Again, we, we try and we, we often concentrate, don't we, on the horizontal relationships with people rather than our, on our relationship with God. We see the blessed consequence at the end of the verse, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Thou forgive a murderous adulterer of his sin. All my sin gone. It's cancelled. The ledger is gone. The debt is paid. And that's why 1 John 1 9 says, and we quoted verse 8 a minute ago, but verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? From all unrighteousness. Psalm 86 verse 5, <coughs> excuse me, says, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. It's almost the idea, isn't it, that God is constantly there. It is the idea. God is constantly there, just waiting to hear our confession. We don't have to convince him. We don't have to bring great arguments. He is ready to forgive. James reminds us that we do not have because we do not ask. He is plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon him. Notice this, only to those who call upon him. So we won't know God's mercy if we remain silent. If we remain unmoved, we won't know his mercy. Even as a believer, we might go through periods of weeks, months, and possibly years of not enjoying the benefits of God's love and God's grace because of unconfessed sin. Fourthly, a desired state. A desired state. The prize is in one word, for this. Look at verse 6. For this. Referring back to what he's just said, this is the prize. The forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, the cleansing from all sin. This is the price. So it's not going in search of some uh, article like the Crusades and in search of some article from, physical article from the, the history of Christ. No, this is the price. This is what we're after. The great crusade of the Christian is to know forgiveness. To know for sure that I am forgiven of all my sins. And cleansed from all unrighteousness. It is the universal need of God's people. It says, shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee. We could put it this way. Everyone who is of God shall pray unto thee. Yes, unbelievers need forgiveness, but they never seek it. We need, and in fact, I think we need to remind ourselves, sometimes we think about forgiveness and we, we have this outward look. What the scripture actually shows us here is that we need forgiveness. We need daily forgiveness. We don't just sort of live and this is one of the dangers of Arminianism that, you know, it, it concentrates, well, back in the 5th of May, 1985, I, I believed in Christ, therefore all my sins are, are gone. No, the scripture says we must confess daily our sins. 
Because it's not just about getting to heaven. You see, if salvation was just about getting to heaven, well, then we wouldn't need it because we've believed and therefore eternity is granted to us. But it's not just about that. It's about a right relationship with the Lord. And thirdly, it's the priority of seeking forgiveness in a time when thou mayest be found. We need to be careful, even as believers, because if we leave it too long, God might pull back from us, not that we lose our salvation, but to teach us, to chastise us, and then we lose our peace for an extended period of time. The primary way, we talked about this again in the last week or so, the primary way that God chastises his people is by to withdraw his peaceful presence from us. It's not causing one of our children to be sick. That's what the devil would say to us. The devil would say, well, God is chastising you by making one of your children sick. No, not at all. It's by removing the peace of salvation from you. That's his way of chastising you. So you'll go after it. See, God doesn't punish his children as someone who wants to cause them pain. God wants to draw you back to this blessed place. The comfort of God to his people, it says, Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him says in the Psalm 91, a thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee, only with thine eyes thou shalt behold the reward of the wicked. Why? Because God, because thou hast made the Lord, which is thy refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. There's a good verse for our present day. That's not to say that we're guaranteed physical health. But nothing happens outside the will of God for our lives. Fifthly, a realized relationship, verse 7. Notice the three personal pronouns in this verse. It's not the things of God, but it's God himself that is the blessing. Look what it says. Thou art my hiding place. Not thou givest me a hiding place, but thou thyself art my hiding place. God is our protection, but God is also our preservation. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Being with God, being in fellowship with God, being walking with the Lord is our protection, is our preservation. But not only is God our protection, our preservation, he is the provider of praise. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. How has God done this? God has provided us the songs of deliverance. The very song that David is writing, the very song he is singing, this is what God's way of providing us, of compassing us about with these spirit-inspired words to express the deliverance of God's salvation. It is a realized relationship. But then sixthly, we have, and here's where the application really comes. Well, it's all application, but in verses 8 to 11, we have maybe more so. It's a promise of discipleship. God is our instructor. Again, notice the three verbs. I will instruct thee. God himself is our instructor. <laughs> we hate instruction manuals, don't we? If you're like me, I've got loads of them in the drawer. Well, maybe they're gone now, but uh, somewhere I think they are. And what do we do? We, we actually choose quite often, we actually choose to just chance it ourselves, don't we? 
you know, we look at the first page or two, and it's too much. I mean, I've got instruction manuals that are like 200 pages. Like, you're not going to read all that. We'll just, you know, we'll chance it. But imagine for a moment if the man who wrote the instruction manual knocked on your door. What would you say to him? You wouldn't say, oh, it's fine, I don't need you. Oh, come on in. Here's the man who actually knows all about the machine. It's exactly what we have, isn't it? Because God has not just said, I will give you a book. God has said by his spirit, I will come to you. I will instruct you. I will personally be the one who brings you through all the processes and I will carefully guide you so that you do not make those fatal errors. And even when you're going to make a fatal error, I will stand in your way. A believer said to me a few weeks ago, he says he, he's convicted and, and convinced of the fact that he would have committed many terrible sins. But God just stopped him. God just prevented him. Because we don't just have a book. We have the one who has written the book, who has written the manual as our instructor. Secondly, he's our teacher. It says, and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. So instruction leading to teaching, which opens the way before us and makes things clear to us. So that Jesus said in 1 John, or sorry, that the John says in 1 John 2 verse 27, the anointing which ye have received in him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. Now John is not saying that you don't need teachers. Because that would be, I'd be immediately redundant if, that, if that's what he was saying. But what he's saying is this. I don't need to convince you of these things. You already know them. In fact, Hopefully, as I've said, most of what I've said today, you, in your mind, maybe your face doesn't say it, but your mind is saying, absolutely. That's it. And that's not because I'm very clever. It's because we have the same spirit and we have faith in the same book, the same word of God. So God is our instructor. He's our teacher. Thirdly, he is our guide. I will guide thee with mine eye. Do you know what I just, I have a confession, I, I, I just noticed that for the first time, because I was, I was concentrating on guide, and I missed mine eye. Just now I see it, with my eye. <laughs> it's amazing, the short time you think he's got every phrase there, I've literally just noticed that. God is not just guiding us, he's guiding us with his own eye. Because he is leading us. He's looking ahead. He's focusing. It's not like maybe an instructor would say, well, there's the book, and if you have any problems, come back to me. No, the instructor says, come with me. I'll go the same way. I'll go ahead of you. Ahead of you. Because he has. He's gone the way of the cross. He's gone to glory via the suffering and he guides us with his own vision so God is our instructor how the, the how of the Christian life our teacher the way of Christ's life and God is our guide the journey and destination of the Christian life and then lastly the disciple instructed. And there's three things in verses 9 to 11 as we close. The psalm closes with practical instruction for the Christian life. There are three kinds or methods of instruction in these verses. And again, just very briefly, just to show them to you. By the way of illustration, first of all, what we're not to be, we're not to be like a horse or a mule which have no understanding whose mouth must be held with a bit and bridle. We, we must grow up in Christ. You know, we must get to the point where the Lord doesn't have to chasten us every five minutes. 
You know, that, I'm not saying that we can become independent. We can never become independent of God. In glory, when we're perfect, when we're even like Christ, we will be everlastingly dependent upon God. But what's been said is here, we must not remain sort of babies that need all the attention that babies need. And I won't go into detail, but you know what I'm saying. We need to grow up in Christ. We need to be mature men and women and not needing to constantly be brought back to the most basic principles of what it is to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, there's a comparison by way of contrast what we are to do on why in verse 10. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusted in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about what a contrast what a contrast this is a recurring theme in Isaiah isn't it that we're going through there's no peace saith your God to the wicked many sorrows but he that trusts in the Lord mercy shall compass him about it's a bit like what we do when we're uh, maybe moving house and what do we do, especially with the fragile things? We put them in a box and we wrap them around with all this stuff, all this padding or whatever that protects because they're so precious to us. Well, we are so precious to God that he surrounds us with his mercy. And thirdly, and lastly, we have an exhortation and the reason given. Be glad in the Lord. Rejoice, ye righteous. Shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Listen, now get this. One of the greatest protections in the Christian life is simply to be thankful, to rejoice. Nehemiah puts it this way. The joy of the Lord is what? Your strength. The, the weakness of the Israelites in, in, in the wilderness was they constantly complained. There's nothing worse than a complaining Christian. Always got a problem. Never see the, the good part. Always see the bad part. Do you know what? That's a cancer in your own soul. It's a cancer in your soul. If you're not a joyful, thankful Christian, you're actually doing yourself damage. You're doing yourself damage. By not praising the Lord. Psalm 92 says it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It's a good thing in two ways. In principle, it's a good thing. It's the right thing to do. But then pragmatically, it's good for you. Subjectively, objectively and subjectively, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Practice it. And you think, what's well, that's fake? No. It takes practice. It's not just something, we're not, we're not Pentecostals, are we? We don't think, oh, we'll wait for just the zap to come from heaven to change us. No, no, we need to grow in the grace and knowledge, which means learning to rejoice. Practice thanksgiving. You know, the, one of the reasons we give thanks for our food is so there's regular thanksgiving, and maybe some of us who maybe eat a little bit more, we should be thanking God a little bit more, but it's practicing giving thanks to God. So to be glad, rejoice, shout for joy. Shout for joy. Yes, we're not Pentecostal in doctrine, but maybe we need a little bit more of Pentecostal in practice. You know, you're getting worried about me now, but <laughs> let's rejoice. Let's be glad. Let's shout for joy. Because we, who are so right in our doctrine, should have much more reason to give praise to God than those who are not. Paul says to the Philippians in this way, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. And may God bless his word to our souls. Let us sing just three verses from...
that psalm, and they're all um, separated. Uh, and we're going to sing verse 1, verse 7, and verse 11. Psalm 32, and verse 1, verse 7, and verse 11. O oh, blessed is the man to whom is freely pardoned all the transgression he hath done, whose sin is covered. Verse 7, Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt from trouble keep me free. Thou with songs of deliverance about shall compass me. Verse 11, Ye righteous in the Lord be glad, in him do ye rejoice, all ye that upright are in heart. For joy, lift up your voice. Psalm 32, verses 1, 7, and 11. Let us stand to sing. Oh, Bless us now as we turn to the table of communion in Jesus' name. 